It's a pleasure to be here, and, and again, uh, part of that background, I'm actually a much better civil culturist and forester than I am a fire guy, but I was blessed with the Forest Service in all those years, your day job, sell 30 million board feet timber, go do TSI reforestation on thousands of acres, but when it's time to get yelled up and go drop the match, buddy, it was all hands on deck. So I got to experience a lot of prescribed fire. I had a lot of really good mentors, uh, was always, and, and so what I want to do is talk about strategies from one practitioner to the other. Okay, this is real general, but we hear the same things and it fits, and that's why I titled this Across the Range of Short Leaf. Don't get hung up, oh, he's in Alabama and he burns in Georgia. Hey, this fits right out the door. You can be in Arkansas, East Texas, the whole range. These strategies, my friendly advice from one practitioner to the other or a line officer that maybe isn't a fire uh, person, these strategies will help you extend because the, the first thing that comes out of the gate, you ask people, well, you got these barriers and they're real, I get it. And they fit the whole country. You got air quality regulations. We got to give Caesar what Caesar's. I get that. But you know what? I'm going to show you ways that you can work within the bounds. And it sounds risky, but it's actually very shrewd. You're minimizing your risk of a screw up or what I call a uh-oh. So if you'll just listen and bear with me, I'm not trying to say this to shove it down your throat, but I want you to have some confidence that I've been doing this a long time. I'm not an expert. But I've been doing this a long time, so all that background is not to boast, but to give you confidence that this is good stuff, okay? And if someone would have told me this in my early days on the Washita, I'd have been dangerous times 10, okay? So, prescribed fire needs you. All right, right now, that little fox in the middle, obviously this is Photoshop, that represents a lot of things. Shortly pine people, and again, we're not just focusing on short leaf at the expense of everything else, but we're an anomaly. People that burn in hardwoods, that's us in the middle. We're surrounded by people like, are you nuts? Uh, people that promote use of fire, and, and I, would, I wouldn't call it aggressive use, just shrewd use. So right now, I mean, if the, if the people surrounding us got a whiff of us, they'd be on us, right? <sighs> Going for the throat. So we got to kind of win their hearts and minds, and through science, and mainly through good work, that's kind of how you raise the bar where you get that informed consent, public acceptance. They're not gonna come out and hug your neck and thank you for what you do. And we can't say thank you for holding your breath while we burn. That doesn't work, okay? We have to strike a balance. Obviously, the range of short leaf is very extensive. We have stands. Uh, these are opportunities as I lead into the strategies. I'm gonna get down in the weeds, and some of it's kind of technical, but uh, I'm, I'm hitting the high points. So you work with existing stands, because guess what? That's what's mainly out there. Plantations are easy, okay? But the cool thing about short leaf is if you have these two or three stems per acre or two trees per five acres, it's an opportunity to work within that resource and expand out. Not just all plantation stuff, but again, natural regeneration. I love short leaf. A lot of things are against it. Oh, it just produces seed every five to seven years. That's a negative, but I see it as a positive. Guess what? It loves fire at an early age, so you bank those seed crops. Do you have to get it in one shot? Hell no. I'll take a good seed crop, and I'll burn two years later, and a few more adds to the stock. You top kill it, your grown root stock. But over time, you bank that regeneration. Don't sit back and do nothing until you get the big, good seed crop here. You're wasting six years out of seven. Pop that thing every year. You know, come back to that. So some stands aren't in the best repair, other stands are in pretty good shape. Now obviously we wanna to move towards that, but don't overlook what's right before your eyes, okay? So, quickly, this is to paint the picture. Take advantage of what Short Leaf offers. Now we already know this, and these aren't just talking points. This is so you can convince your boss, your line officers, your clients. You know, if you don't kick against the pricks, it, things aren't as hard as we think. It's the most widely distributed pine. That's a good thing. Work that to your advantage. It's adapted to a wide range of soils, slope, topography, aspect, temperatures, precipitation, all of these things. I'm not gonna read it to you, but all of this is in your favor. So duh, here's a good piece of advice right out of the gate. Take advantage of what's right before your eyes. Don't overlook those opportunities. All right, so again, a lot of natural stands. 
and particularly here in the Barrens, it just breaks my heart that you guys don't have markets. And you're not going to crack that nut anytime soon. So instead of falling on your sword, surrendering, if that's all you get to do right now is to light them or fight them and use human cause fire for resource objectives, wink, wink, let the sucker burn out to the road, don't drop retarding on it, just take that uh, defensive posture. That's how you kind of stretch some stuff that you can't do right now but work with stands. But if all you get to do is just put fire in those systems, that's, that's huge, okay? Now all the other stuff, we would like to cut it, spray it, do the savanna, just do what you can do. But in the meantime, that's important. And we, you guys know that, so I'm leading into, okay, now how do I do that? I got all this uh, adversarial stuff in front of me. In New Jersey, eight and a half million people. As one guy said the other day, eight and a half million different perspectives. All right. So first thing, again, uh, set it on fire, okay? Do what you can. And then systems that are in pretty good shape, don't turn your back on that, all right? That's not real pretty, that's really nice. And it's just human tendency, particularly for managers, limited resources, we need to do more of that. It's like, whoa, before you go breaking new ground, if you got any of that, you better be burning that first. And if you don't, shame on you. Because if you turn your back on that to go chasing that, by the time you get that looking like that, that looks like that. <laughs> All right, now where I learned to do math in Arkansas, this isn't a tough sell, you know? So again, hang on to what you got. So the first strategy, practical advice, is you maintain good habitat. That's your number one thing. It all goes to planning. All right. Certain areas are wind sensitive. I can only burn this with a northeast wind, or I can only burn this in the dormant season. So get your mind around all of those. But those uh, good areas, when it's time to burn, and you'll find out real quick when you do smoke screening, you have a lot more acceptable wind directions than you think you do, okay? So when you gotta do a burn with a northeast wind, you be ready to go there. Again, takes time. You got to do planning. You got to do a lot of analysis, etc. So you know these sensitive wind directions. Because at the end of the day, our number one hurdle is where you're going to aim your smoke, right? So do the planning. Be cocked and ready. Don't miss opportunities to burn. Get as much as experience as you can. Be a sponge. Ask questions. Just like this, get around people. Get different viewpoints. And um, and then if you have to go somewhere else to get experience, to get your confidence up, your capacity, do whatever it takes so you can be ready to go. Because remember, you just don't wake up with this. I am so thankful that when I first started, I had people on the Washita that cut me a lot of slack. They let me just go get it. That was in the days when, the good old days, I guess, of the Forest Service. Now, they didn't let me walk off the cliff, but I really appreciated that because that gave me confidence, which I don't lack that now. But again, everybody has to start somewhere. And then also, just really think about sequencing your treatments. Fire sometimes isn't the first tool, the first thing you can put on the ground. You might have to fuel wood it, thin it, use a logging job to beat it down. If it's thick and horrible, you can't throw a cat through it. So think about, do I need to do a mechanical treatment? Do I need a commercial thing? Fire maybe not be the, the first thing to do but it's part of it. So think about it, sequence those treatments, those prescriptions, so you can get it done quickly. And one thing I mentioned about mentoring, this is just, again, I'm not giving you, I just want you to think, this is our VFD in Clay County, Alabama, Kalita Valley. And Kalita in uh, Creek actually means fire, fire valley. So our VFD guys are normally trained to put the wet stuff on the red stuff, right? Well, not our group, we, these guys can do behave. Okay, they can calculate one hour fuel moisture, moisture of extinction, probability of ignition. They can do all of that. Because most of our fires that we go to, I want them to apply the right tactic. Hey, let's go direct, let's go indirect, let's call the forest service, let's do this, let's burn out to a road or creek. So once a year we do live fire demos, okay, on private land where they go out and of course we do, you know, suppression stuff, let them cut a scrape, use a blower. But mainly we, we got drip torches on our rigs. Okay, so we want them to understand that. And that's part of mentoring, okay? A lot of these guys, not just for fire departments, but everybody needs some stick time. So take any opportunity to mentor, because somebody mentored me, and I really, really appreciated that. It's time to pass that on. So again, get on as many opportunities as you can, engage landowners. 
this guy, uh, that was a 14-year-old stand, never had been burned, live lolly plantation. So when we got ready to, to thin it, this guy, he didn't know, he asked me, I said, well, the first thing we need to do is a pre-mark and burn, because we're going to put a logging crew in there in about four months. Hadn't been burned in 14 years. So that day, it was 65% humidity, about 40 degrees. Fuel moisture is like 12% for litter. Now that's at 8.30 in the morning, and uh, one hour fuel moisture is like 12 or 13%, which is damp. Now what do you think that would do on a good burn day? So by applying that strategy to get the result, but I wanted the landowner to have an appreciated, I mean, he had a, a grin on his face. So he got scared at first, but then he said, hey, you know, there's a reason that we're burning this today. He didn't see that. So he gained an appreciation for professional advice. So again, you gotta get the landowners in there. Sometimes fire alone, I mean, that looks kind of bad. Three months later, we did a fourth row thinning and it's a beautiful plantation. Sometimes you do things uh, mid-rotation release. Uh, this is a logging job. Believe it or not, we commercially thinned that and fuel wood chipped it as well. We cut bushes that was one inch in diameter, sweet gums. Probably 30 tons per acre of stuff that normally you couldn't cut. Chipped it, blew it in the back of van, got 50 cents a ton for it. It wasn't the money, it was just the idea that we sequenced the treatment. We did this thinning, opened that thing up, Got cost share from NRCS the next year, helicopter sprayed 165 acres, mid-rotation release, led a coppice back. That stand went from no grassy understory by sequencing those treatments, a thinning, a few wood, a spray, and then a burn, a burn first, then the logging and that, and now it's, it's a pine savanna, wham, within two growing seasons. So again, sequence those treatments to get that result. As soon as the last log's off the deck, we light it up. Now again, don't get hung up that this is a lob lolly plantation. It's the concept of having effectiveness. So do the understory burn. Burning piles particularly, another strategy. I'll cover that in a minute. Sometimes again, fire alone's not it. You have to do better living through chemistry, okay? You might skitter spray, hand spray, fly it on, but sometimes a chemical application will make fire more effective because fire by itself ain't gonna do it. So again, sequence these prescriptions and go. So again, now I wanna get down into the weeds real quick on some strategies. Uh, and this is stuff you understand. Minimize the risk of an escape by blacking in areas. This is the most underutilized tactic. Like that moist day when the landowner was crawling through that stand, a day that it couldn't get out, you might go out there and black in eight or 10 miles of boundary, okay, it burns in chain, two chains deep, 100 feet, 200 feet, kind of skunks around, goes out, you bomb proof that boundary. So then on the better day, when you want 22% RH or eight mile hour wind, and you don't want that thing punching out, you blacked in that area on a marginal day and, and you've minimized your risk of escape. It's two bites at the apple, but I guarantee when you go out and burn that 1400 acres, you don't need 15 people, okay? You need two people on ATV patrolling 10 miles of perimeter that's already three chains black, and it's pretty boring to be on the holding crew that day, right? It's not gonna get out, and then you can be more efficient. So consider black lining in as a strategy to minimize your risk of escape, because that's what most people fear, the fire breaching the line. Well, I got news for you, that's the easiest thing to deal with is uh-oh. Uh, you can't unring the bell with the smoke episode, okay? You should fear smoke worse than an escape, but blacking in and burning at night, here's a plantation. Now granted, this is provided you do smoke screening and you got public acceptance. But you know, burn a 100 acre plantation at night. You know, it's easy burn. That way you get your daytime burns done and you save those chips. I'm gonna burn that at night. I'm not gonna waste my daytime burn. I'm saving that sucker for night, okay? So again, the planning is how you extend, it's a strategy, how you extend getting things done. This is a uh, red cockade woodpecker clusters on these plantations. We got like 40 active groups of birds. It's kind of a pain in the rear now. We've created a monster. I got 350 cavity trees to rake around. But you know what? I prep the puppies at night. That's grass. The moisture of extinction is like 15%. So about dark 30, it won't burn with the blowtorch. So that's the best time for me not to light up that resin. I'll rake around the tree, etc. And I can go out there and rake around and light off uh, 80 to 100 trees a night after a hard day at work right before Miller time. 
And then when we go do a daytime burn, that cluster is safe. So my fire's rolling through the timber, it hits that RCW group, it's already blacked, it just rolls around it. I'm not out there wasting my time at 11.30 or one in the afternoon prepping woodpecker trees. So that nighttime burn, moisture of extinction, that grass fire is gonna be out 20 minutes later. Go home and go to bed, don't pull an all nighter. It ain't gonna burn. So again, a strategy, take advantage of that. Black in areas, there's something we did without a fire line. Did it late in the evening or on a high humidity day just to black that thing in so later on, now I got eight or 10 miles of line I don't have to worry about, okay? I get more done. So again, just simple strategies. Burning piles. Remember, piles, it takes them a long time to get wet. It takes them a long time to get dry. So when you burn a pile, you don't want to have a lot of smoke, right? So how do you dial up less smoke? The highest intensity fire you can generate, which means you got to let that pile get really, really, really dry. Don't burn it when it's damp. It's just a smoking heap. So you do it at a time of the year where that pile's, pile is really kicking, but it's not spotting out because it's got green fuels or the moisture of extinction. So again, burn your piles, get that out of the way, so when, then when you do the daytime broadcast burn, you're not worried about that 30 ton pile of 100,000 hour fuels. Burn those suckers at night. Does that look like an intense fire? Yeah, that thing is really cranking. Did it at night. It's chunking embers the size of my fist. It's landing in damp grass. It can't catch up. What's the problem? Go light eight or 10 piles, grab a, a picture or two and then go sleep like a baby. You got no risk of the fire escaping. You try and do that during the day when the fuel moisture is 6% and it's chunking embers that big, uh, you're gonna be fighting fire. So again, apply these strategies. Just use what nature gives you to your advantage. Again, know the local KBDI, the wetness, dryness of fuels. I'm gonna go a little quicker, I'm getting short. And again, this presentation's available. Just remember these strategies are simple things that you can do to stay within bounds and extend your, your burn days. Because you gotta be really careful. Remember, smoke's the bugaboo. So if you uh, got organic soils or you got deep duff or infrequently burned systems, if you don't know what KBDI is, you better figure it out because you will, you can't unring the bell. You light off that duff and you're like, uh-oh because it's gonna to smoke today, tonight, tomorrow, tomorrow night, the next day, the next night, until you get a rain event. So you can see that train coming, don't do that. Know these uh, uh, points when you need to, to stop. So again, here's, uh, again, it's long leaf pine, I know it's not short leaf, but it's the concept of when you're doing a grown season burn, typically it's like really, really hot, and you better understand what the KBDI is, because that was a good burn but if you had uh, deep uh, organic soils or organic soils or deep litter, uh, you got a good burn, but you could excite and light off those, those uh, fuels you don't want to burn, and then you got a problem. All right. <clears throat> Remember, consider and use all tactics with smoke management. Dilution, avoidance, minimization. And remember, avoidance doesn't mean don't burn. Avoidance means avoid a wind direction that's going to put something on an SSA. If you got a retirement home of trial lawyers downwind, that's probably not a good idea to vector your smoke towards those guys, okay? So again, this is just common stuff, but use those tactics, and that's how you avoid stepping on your poncho. But you know, most of us don't do that, or the, even the fire people. They, they get so locked in on the certain way of doing it, and they're missing opportunities. All right, and again, consider the entire year. Often that's a missed opportunity. I guarantee you, if you could do 15 to 25% of your program, whether it's 100 acres a year or 10,000 acres a year, if you can get some of that out before Christmas, that's good, early dormant season or during the growing season. If you get that much out, guess what? It gave you more days when the weather's good and meteorological conditions are best for smoke dispersal, January, February, March, to get more done. So over plan and be ready to under implement, but get it shelf ready, project ready, and go. And try and get out of that rut that, oh, we never burned before, we gotta wait till deer season's over. Well, maybe sorta, kinda, but think that through, talk that through. Again, the KBDI, you have to get with your local folks, but if you know these cutoff points, for example, uh, if you're doing a dormant season burn, you probably wanna stop 
when the KBDI gets over 300. Because normally in the dormant season, it's going to be well under single digits to less than 100. And a high, uh, a KBDI 80 doesn't mean it won't burn. All those surface fuels will burn good. But in the dormant season, it gets over 300. That's not normal. That's way drier than normal. And if you get one going and you ignite those 10-hour fuels, 100-hour fuels, get the duff going, now you got to do heavy mop-up. So know these thresholds so you just don't screw up, okay? So again, you're after the effect, all sorts of tactics. And again, particularly with short leaf, everybody's trained, oh, you can't put fire in a loblolly plantation, slash your short leaf until the trees get 10 years old. Eh. You know, short leaf particularly, you can put fire in the stand. Now, I got a few uh, people that will go this way, most will go, you're nuts. You can burn after age two or three. It's never too early to start putting fire in short leaf. But that's what you do, you back into it. Use behave, use the science to say, look, I can take anything less than a two foot flame length with a three chain rate of spread or whatever, you know, you pick your metric and then use the science to guess what, to calculate one hour fuel moisture and it can't do that. Does that uh, less than a foot flame length look like a, something scary? No. So you know what, why couldn't you put fire like that in a stand that's this tall, age four from seed or whatever? And remember shortly if you top kill a tree or two, you just pissed it off, it's gonna sprout, it's coming back with 10 of its buddies, it's not a problem, okay? So remember, put fire in stands as early as you can, burn them at night, burn them on the high, one hour a few moisture days, make that thing do what you wanna do. So, my last slide. It's not how much you burn, it's how safe you burn. Now, once you get a lot of land in good shape, then you can burn a lot more because it's grass, it's light fuels, you're burning you know, three tons per acre instead of 12. It gets easier, okay? So you can do more, but right out of the gate, don't worry about how much. Just do it safely, build that confidence, that capacity, start over the hill where you can't screw up if you try, nobody can see it, don't excite the public. And then remember, prescribed fire is a safe way. This is the old talking point. It's a safe way to apply natural process, your ecosystem health, reduce fire risk. When you're talking to the public that doesn't get it, those four points, you say it's safe, it's natural, um, and it's ecological, and you reduce fire risk. Most people can get their mind around that. So to me, that's the best definition of prescribed fire. And then in closing, if you're not a member of a state prescribed fire council, shame on you. Fix that starting tomorrow. Find, uh, seek them out. And then lastly, it's not hard to be wise. Think of something stupid. Don't do it. Okay, here's Grandpa going direct. The little yard fire got out. He's in the fuel model one. I know Grandpa's going direct attack. He doesn't realize just south of the old equator, he's sitting on two gallons of gas in a plastic tank, okay? <laughs> But at least he's blowing it back into the black, okay? So I'll give him credit for that. Now, if you don't do, apply basic things in fire, and we do this all the time, not that. It's not hard to be wise. Think of something stupid, don't do it. The KBDI is above normal. Uh, let, let's go burn. Well, that's stupid. You're gonna cause a smoke episode. So think of something, but that's where you plan. Hey, when the KBDI is really high, it's dry, guess what? Go burn a pile because you want really aggressive fire behavior, but you have to pick a day or a night to where you're not gonna light up the woods. So don't just fear a high KBDI number. That's a good time to go do a pile or do something else, but think this through. Don't do something stupid, okay? So even though this is comical, we see people doing this in fire every day, uh, people that know better. And you're out there like, dude, what are you doing? The dispersion index is like really low or your smoke's not lifting or, or this or that. And what do they do? They got the blinders. Got to get it done. Got to get it done. It's not how much you burn. It's how safe you burn. You get it done safely. You'll get the public's confidence. You'll get your confidence up. You'll mentor your people. Then over time, then you can, you know, rock and roll. So again, thank you for letting me come and share with you. Probably telling you stuff you know. My biggest challenge is use the science. Encourage your people. Don't do something stupid and just embrace these barriers. Air quality, yep, no problem. But there's ways around that. Good smoke management, et cetera. It's, it's just right there for you using. So with the theme of short leaf, 
These are all things in your favor that despite all of the barriers, you got a lot of opportunity. Glass is half full, it ain't half empty. So I'll be here till after lunch or whatever. I appreciated meeting most of you the last couple of days or two. And Mike, again, I was just honored to be asked to come speak. And now what you don't do, when you leave today, going north, going south, going west, or go east to the water's edge, you should be all jacked up and excited and start, you know, lighting it up on your way out. <laughs> No, I'm teasing, don't do that. <laughs>